Oh, gotcha, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for coming to our to our annual snowmobile kickoff for a year of uh, safety meeting. Um, appreciate the amount of law enforcement turns out to come to this county as a centralized location to start this. So I thank all of you guys for being here today. You came from all over. Okay? And uh, it's, been, it's been a great uh, collaborative effort that I've noticed um, over the last uh, nine years that I've, eight, eight years that I've been the sheriff here, and coming to my ninth year. Um, and, and we greatly appreciate uh, the assistance we get from all the other agencies. We couldn't do this together without you. So thank you for what you guys and ladies do out there for us and, and uh, keeping things safe and, and getting the public around and the areas we need to be at. So thank you for that. Um, between uh, Deputy Leviker and uh, Sergeant Beck Kronizer with the Parks and Recs, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm very thankful for those guys, always for um, getting the information out, uh, coordinating this, this meeting together, <coughs> and having you guys all here. So uh, I'm not going to blow off too much more wind. I'm going to let Mike and those guys address you and get, get going. But like I said, again, I want to thank you guys for coming again this year. Let's hope we have a safe season. Uh, again, I, I know we had some fatalities last year and things, and it pretty much comes down to two things, speed and alcohol. So um, I know in the past I've been, uh, as I say, not, not, uh, let's say not quiet, but you know, just a little uh, on the happy side. Well, I'm not being on the happy side for a little while. I think that uh, things that need to be done more so this year is going to kick the heck out of them when it comes to DWIs out there in the snowmobiles. No, they didn't learn from the speed, but you know what? I think we start locking more people up to DWI in the snowmobiles, they're going to send a loud and clear message out to some of these riders. And uh, that's, that's what we have to do. So I, that's what I'm going to ask my guys and, and uh, to do that a little more this year and probably pull some more of those uh, uh, snowmobile uh, intoxication checkpoints. We can do that. So I think it's a good way to send a loud and clear message to some of the knuckleheads out there. Well, okay, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mike and, uh, and go from there. Okay? So thank you very much for being here today, guys. Have a safe season and a Merry Christmas. Hey, my name is Deputy Mike Lugerger. I just want to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, we kind of made this a little bit better program. Most everybody here has been coming for years. Uh, Nicole Unser, she's the head of the snowmobile unit in Albany. She's in an office of two people right now. So <laughs> her and her assistant run the whole state program. We have Ann Moser, our Lewis County District Attorney. She's going to talk after her about the reform bill and maybe how it's going to affect recreational tickets, uh, maybe local law tickets. Um, and the State Snowmobile Association is here. And they'll give a, what happened last year and what the work I guess. So, uh, yeah, next PowerPoint should work a little bit better. Uh, explaining everything, so I'll turn it over to uh, okay. Nicole. Yeah. Hi everybody, I'm Nicole. Um, as these gentlemen said, thank you all for coming. Uh, law enforcement does play a huge role in, in the program and trying to keep everybody safe. Um, it doesn't always impact people that take risks, but um, you know, without law enforcement, I think that the environment of things would be way worse. Um, this is Eric Weinreber. He is a member of the Marine Unit in parks. He is also one of our snowmobile law enforcement development school instructors. He has been for quite a long time as well as a marine law enforcement instructor. So he's going to push through the slides. Uh, I do want to say I don't mean to speed through things, but I do have a child home with strep and I have to be back in town to get him to a 230 doctor. So hopefully I'm out of here by noon. Um, so um, this is our accident report. I do want to make note that, um, as Mike mentioned, we're a unit of two right now. <coughs> For any of you that didn't know, a long time employee, Bennett Campbell, took a promotional opportunity outside of our unit back in July. Um, we have also, unfortunately, lost uh, Jim McFarland to um, medical leave, which was not anticipated. Uh, back in July. So thankfully, I was able to get a seasonal in and without knowing exactly how somebody coming into such a diverse and busy program, um, what I was going to come up against when you get a 22 year old in. I have to tell you, she's been doing an amazing job. She's the one that built this report. She worked very closely with Mike Leviker to make sure that it was as useful as possible. So while she couldn't attend today, today I do want to thank her for the time and effort that she's put in and the outstanding job that she's been doing supporting our unit when we were shorthanded. So, <clears throat> so this summer,
summary is going to compile accident statistics for the 2018-19 snowmobile season. Uh, this season coincides with the state's fiscal year. So the summary is only going to include reported accidents um, that occurred between April 1st of 2018, March 31st, 2019. So in total, we received 160 reported accidents. Uh, the accidents involved 185 <coughs> operators, resulting in 104 injuries and 21 fatalities. <coughs> um, so you can see here, just over the years, um, previous years, how there's kind of an influx. Um, I have to say that I, I do think that some of the decreases have to do with increased law enforcement, but you know, there's so many other factors that play into these changes, you know, between very between law enforcement activities out there and just the quantity of snow we get on the ground of people get being in condensed in certain areas. So last year we did not have a very good year and we're hoping that we can kind of get out in front of it this year and see if there's anything that we can do to improve that. <coughs> okay, so um, most of the accidents and fatalities were collision with a fixed object. Um, you all need to know that when we received the reports in, there only there's a lot of times where we hear about different components of the accident through word of mouth or the media. We can only report on what we receive on that written report. So what we found was we had 65 incidents with a collision with a fixed uh, object. Um, I didn't think that this would be something that you guys would all want to know, but um, Mr. Leverker said it is something that's important, and Melissa actually thought it was too, is the time of day. I was a little surprised that most of the accidents occurred between noon and 6 p.m., uh, almost half of them. So I guess it is good information to know. You know, maybe there needs to be more patrols during that time or, um, you know, some, some adjustments that could be happening out in the field. Um, so the leading factors are unsafe speed, failing to negotiate turns, and alcohol involvement. Um, I don't see that changing anytime soon. It's kind of just... <laughs> I think it's always going to be those three <coughs> factors. Um, um, okay. no, go ahead. So accidents by counties. Uh, Herkimer County had 47 total accidents reported with seven fatalities. Uh, 41 of those were in the town of Webb with six fatalities. Um, you know, a lot of that has to do with, that's where they get the snow, that's where the riders go. Um, I know that the clubs, and I can't speak for um, the permitted trails, but most of them are marked safely. I think that it's just the environmental thing and the fact that so many people flood there. But you can see <coughs> Lewis County came in, uh, in second, and then Hamilton County came in third. The other kind of few and far between. Uh, again, leading factors, the unsafe speed topped all other leading factors, but alcohol involvement also played a role in seven fatalities. Um, there's limited stuff that we can do for telling people don't <coughs> drink and ride. Uh, last year we got a lot of calls from the press, you know, what are you doing to make sure that people don't drink and ride? I think that law enforcement is doing their part. I think that there may be changes coming. Um, I know that a lot of people want stricter uh, law and stricter policies for when you're drinking and riding. Um, I had gotten a call from a DMV office recently where the woman, she actually said, I have a gentleman here who is trying to register a snowmobile who lost his license due to a DWI. She said, can I, can I let him register his snowmobile? And I said, yes. 
And she says, um, I can. And I said, yes. <laughs> she was a little surprised. And I said, yeah, right now there's, there's no, there's nothing written in law. And there's no impact when a person loses their motor vehicle license through DMV. There's there's no restriction as far as losing the capability to operate another motorized vehicle being a snowmobile. So, um, you know, I know that you may discuss it, but I know that NYSA has talked about, you know, safety and, and how to make things more safe and hold people a little bit more accountable when they're making decisions. <coughs> So, okay. um, so here's the actual breakdown of the reports that we received with date, location, the factor, and then the result of the accident. I do have 10 printed copies here. This report, um, we've asked that it be placed up on our website, so you should be able to find that under the document section if you want to not take a printed copy and you want to just peruse it later. Um, yep, so this is just a summary of all the accidents that we have reported. Um, and then here's just a list of the fatalities by county. And then um, this is the end of my quick report. I wanted to give special thanks to um, the county, uh, town and local sponsors involved in the trail planning, development, and maintenance the snowmobile clubs across New York State who maintain safe snowmobile trails for use <clears throat> through their volunteer labor, the New York State Snowmobile Association, and then uh, state, city, county, town, and village law enforcement departments who operate snowmobile patrols, respond to accidents, and prepare their reports, which form this summary. Uh, first responders who are often the first on scene of the accidents with life-saving assistance, and then all the snowmobilers who are committed to safe and ethical riding, including many who stop to furnish assistance in the event of an accident. Um, so there's Melissa Patton, oh, Jim McFarland, as you know, is now out. We have Eric <laughs> standing in today. Um, so that's that's the end of the, yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I'll just, uh one thing I wanted to point out, because uh, they didn't really put this out in the slide there, but when we look at the numbers of accidents involving alcohol, and you look at the number of fatals affecting alcohol, which is about 33% of the fatals involve alcohol, when you look at the regular accidents, that percentage looks a lot smaller. Which one of those do you think is more accurate? The fatals. Roughly 33% of fatals are involving acts or involving alcohol, and it's probably pretty close to that with regular accidents. It's just that the people who are drunk don't report until the next day. How many guys out here have gotten reports the next day? Oh, by the way, last night I hit a tree. You know, you can't do anything about it, but alcohol is an important factor. And look at the number of the percentage of fatals, and that's the pretty close to what the number of accidents, percentage of accidents that are caused with alcohol is one of the contributing factors. I just wanted to point that out because it really didn't show it there, but that's just something to consider. <coughs> oh, no, that's right. Um, and I just wanted to make note also, um, I know Mike had mentioned that we, there's going to be a lot of questions regarding the Snowville Law Enforcement State Aid Grant Program. Um, I don't see this three-page document on on my desktop, but I will have it posted. Um, I had Melissa take intake all of the activities from the annual activity sheets that we get submitted, and I'm not going to go down through all of these um, right now, but I just want to mention if anybody's familiar here with how you've submitted <coughs> law enforcement reimbursement, you're gonna, the officers are gonna recognize this page of the activity sheet. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of criteria that goes in that we collect, and it's not usually reported on, and I wanna start reporting on it, because I think it's important. Um, so overall, the summary 
So the song of the Long <coughs> Grant is, um, and I know that Roseanne is going to touch a little bit more. She's going to have the numbers that I have here in her report that she passed out. So this year we had 20 participants. Uh, payouts were based on a prorated factor of 70.3449463%. So it was just under the 75% that a lot of municipalities were expecting. And here's why. So the overall amount requested in was $389,411.17. Of the amount approved for the allowable submissions, it was $379,084.33. The 75% payments, when they were calculated, it was two hundred eighty-four over $284,000. Uh, right now, Article 2715 stipulates that we cannot go above a $200,000 disbursement. So because of that $84,000 being over the 200, we had prorated again, which is how we got to that uh, final $200,000 amount. Um, so with all of that, what I thought was important to extract from the data that we get in this activity report is there were um, arrests and summonses, <laughs> there were 469 of them reported. 294 of them were snowmobile law, 175 were local ordinances. Out of all of those reported, 91 convictions. 91 convictions reported. So you got these law enforcement officers out writing tickets, issuing summonses, and only 91 convictions. I don't know why that number is so low, but I'm hoping that law enforcement can kind of help elaborate on you know why there's 469 things issued out and there's a very small percentage of things that were actually convicted upon. How do you obtain the conviction data? It is, that's what we the intake from <coughs> the activity reports. I can so tell you, the majority of them are when, like, I work in the Finger Lakes area, and I get the dispositions back from the tickets that I get, and I overlook the other officers. You get a stop, you get, you know, uninsured, snowmobile, unregistered, you may get a speed. <coughs> and I've, we try to talk to our judges, try to get them to understand that a new election cycle, get a new judge and start all over again. There's more dismissals, just flat out dismissals, right. because of lack of... And, and what's going to happen? So These people are just going to say, I, I wasn't held accountable for this offense, and I'm going to go and do it again. Or they get no, charged they with a $50 fine, and right. they just put $50 cash in the pocket. Right. So that's something so I'm going to have to Right. Hold on one second. So to answer your question, this data is collected only, this is only delay data collected from law enforcement agencies that participate in the grant program. So we do not receive this information from any municipality that does not participate with the grant program. Yes? If I could take just a moment. Sure. Um, I actually have first a question. Are you receiving the tickets back with the dispositions? Do you have a percentage? Because you said there was you know, 400, yep. 400 and you got the 91. What about the ones, I mean, how many did you receive back? Well, and that's just it. Um, when I do these, even the accident <coughs> summaries, we don't receive a lot of, of the tickets. Like, that's why um, if I had the little notes, but Eric was kind enough to, <laughs> to go through for me. Um, anytime, like especially when NICE is looking for numbers or the public's looking for numbers or reporters are looking for numbers, I tell them, I can give you numbers, but they're not going to be fully accurate because it's only what is reported to us. Right. So a lot goes unreported. Um, as far as the tickets, we do get the tickets, but we don't like, um, there was a fatality already. We got the early notification. But we then have to, like, you know, we give it time for them. It's supposed to be within 48 hours that we get that report. But because we know that there's so many things, especially with fatality, mm -hmm. like we could be waiting months. Right. There's no tracking mechanism for us to know when we should have something in our hand and we don't. Right. It's just we're merely waiting for people to 
to turn it into us. There's no policy or procedure in place where it tracks it from start to finish. Right. Um, and if I could now, um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Judge Damas from the town of Redfield, and I try very hard every year to be here so that um, you guys recognize, that we recognize how hard you're working at this. And those that work with me, I hope would attest that I have a very open relationship and that I, I listen to their concerns and I take that into account when I am doing dispositions and, and settling these cases. Um, I've tried very hard over the years, after listening to Mr. McFarland, of returning my tickets faster <laughs> with their dispositions. And this year, yay, they were all back by June. Um, but unfortunately, for the gentleman in front of me, it is hard, and I, and I get that. And the only thing I can suggest is, is try to have a better relationship with your judges. The, the gentlemen that work with me, that write the tickets, they know. My goal is not to find these people thousands of dollars. My goal is to go, okay, now you know. There's plenty of mine that come back with a disposition of a zero fine and the $15 surcharge because they showed me proof that they changed the can and that they did modify the, the muffler to the correct one. So it, it's a give and take, and, and I, I don't know, I just, I wanted to make sure that everyone understands that for the most part, from the magistrate's end of it, we are trying, and please don't assume by the dispositions that we're taking for granted what you're doing out there. Question. I you're talking about you know, the, the, the numbers that are in the <coughs> as far as alcohol involvement for the accidents, the people aren't reporting it. In regards to the fails, um, one thing I found out in my reporting is that basically New York State Parks is not made aware of the autopsy reports following the accident. So, you know, you may have a guy speeding and then he goes off a trail and hits a tree, and you put that down as the um, reason for the fatality, but the autopsy may find out that the guy's got like a blood alcohol level of 0.2, it could be on some drug like cocaine or high on marijuana, which an autopsy would reveal. Um, is that going to change this year? Will you be made aware of those autopsy reports when you do this report? That's something that the New York State Soulville Association has recommended. Is that going to change this year? Or are you still in the dark about the autopsy reports? Nicole, uh, yes. we have the most fatalities in the state, and, and I do have the autopsy results of each and every fatality that we have here. Um, and I don't know what you reported, but that's not entirely true. Our contributing factors that we mark down on an accident are based upon our initial investigation. If there's something outlandish that comes back after the autopsy, then we will amend that accident report. That hasn't, I, I haven't had to do that um, in 25 years, right. but, and I can only speak for my agency, but I don't think, uh, you know, obviously if, if a guy's drunk and hits a tree and we find out six months later that he had a massive heart attack, yes, uh, again, I'm only speaking for my agency, we are gonna know that. We do that across the board with all well, the I don't know Yeah, yep. and that's I, I have to say that I'm um, in our in our procedures like we really need to evolve it. Um, I've only been on the job for not even two years yet, right. and I don't know how we've gotten to this point. I know that we have um, which <coughs> hey Mike, do you have a copy of that? accident report that I gave, like the papers that I gave you? Do you have one handy? <coughs> because there's, so anybody who's not familiar, and this is available on our website um, for law report? enforcement. Yeah, accident report. So to look at the criteria of all the fields that you have to fill out, it's really overwhelming. Right. Um, so we can only report on the boxes that are checked off, and that's, that's kind of, it's based on what the officer collects. Um, I know that there's a big thing like where they do they have a safety certificate a lot of times that box is completely skipped over because 
when you're investigating someone who you know got injured or whatever, you're just filling out the most. And, and I understand why it's probably skipped over. You're filling out the things that are like most <coughs> important. Not every field is always filled out, you know, and, and it's based on, you know, that's something that the law enforcement agencies would have to say, here's how you fill out this form, here's how we require it. So we really need to partner up because right now there is not like strict rules or guidelines for every law enforcement agency on doing this. It's kind of like uh, Chief Johnson said, it, you know, that's how they do and their reports are very thorough. And maybe it's because you have all of the, you know, you guys have volume, Lewis County has volume. In other parts of the state, the law enforcement officers may not come across this as frequently and may report it a little bit differently. So part of the reason why we do the law enforcement school, development school every year, is to not just make sure that the law enforcement officers that attend know safety, op, you know, operational safety and things of that measure. We also go over laws and how it should be done. You know, so it's kind of, we're, you know, we're always working on it and I think that we do need to speak with law enforcement and, you know, county legislators to see how they want parks, because parks can't make this decision solely. It really is a combined effort. If you want us to manage or maintain something differently, we just need to, you know, we need to evolve. Because uh, everything, I mean, the climate of everything is changing, so it's just something that we all have to work on improving moving forward. And, and, and I can say that <laughs> the information in many cases from the autopsies is going to have to come through the agency investigating it, because with privacy laws and stuff, it would take um, subpoenas and warrants to get the information from a different agency not involved in the original. So it, it does fall back on the agency that did the investigation to uh, get that information forwarded to us. To yeah, so we're just, it's just... And, and for those that don't know, before working for uh, Parks, I did do 20... Just shy of 28 years as a trooper, and 18 of those I did snowmobile and boat patrol. So, as an officer, I know that we have to get that information forwarded, or else she can't get it. That might help you with your answer. And, and yes, we need to get the message out better to more agencies do it. Are you looking at, looking at changing the uh, action report going in the tracks or a better form? I've made, I've made mention that that has been, um, you know, you're not the only law enforcement agency that has asked for that. I'm not really sure who to approach, but I think it would kind of, um, I'm not really familiar with tracks, but for how I kind of comprehend it working is, you guys have a report, you put it in the system, and then it's electronically followed. Um, I've been mentioning that it's a concern from multiple law enforcement agencies that they would like to see that happen. And I know that there's been kind of uh, resistance in the past just because of <coughs> the overall system and all of the laws that go into, that are in tracks already. I know that there's kind of, to intake parks and nav laws, uh, I know it's always been resistant because it would add a whole other component. So I, I do think that law enforcement, like if you have concerns, I do think that it needs to be brought up, but I don't have the capability to make that happen. Most of the beginning, are they off, are they off the uh, computer form or some are handwritten yet? Or? What's that? The accident form. Uh, most of them are handwritten. handwritten. Are, they, are those legible? No. Oh. No. So and that's that's a huge struggle too. Nicole, real quick. Yes. Um, with the with the accident reports, uh, I work for the state park police, so I work out of our, our headquarters, and I'm the liaison between the snowmobile unit and our agency. Um, I get a lot of phone calls and emails looking for information regarding uh, snowmobile accident reports and reporting <coughs> and things like that. You have to keep in mind too that there's a lot of officers out there that don't have snowmobile training but are being called uh, either through their 911 dispatch centers and things like that to respond to these to these calls. And they may have never done any type of snowmobile training or ever seen an, uh, a snowmobile uh, accident report, and now they're, they're responding to the snowmobile accident, whether it be a fatal or things like that. So 
they're not necessarily familiar with all the information that's on the report, which, you know, um, statistically, I don't know, uh, officer-wise, you know, where we would stand as far as, you know, who's sending in those reports. Have they had any type of training, or have they never seen the report in their life before? Um, and that, that, that there may be discrepancies in, in the reports <coughs> just because of that, just because of the lack of knowledge. Page, but any of the law enforcement officers that um, can get to the law enforcement, um, it's like a private page. I'll put those reporting numbers so that you can see how the breakout is and whatnot. You're in law enforcement, so where is that going to be? Oh yeah, um, so it's kind of a little bit different for us. Um, Lewis County, for anybody that's in Lewis County that didn't know, um, our Stoneville law enforcement training uh, the development school that uh, Town of Webb has won the bid for many years. Uh, Lewis County actually won the bid, and our Snowville Law Enforcement Development School will be held at Boondocks uh, January 26th through January 21st of 2020. So, uh, and I do apologize for anybody that has wanted to sign up or send anybody to the school. We literally just solidified that I will get the announcement posted hopefully early next week. What were those dates again? January 26th through the 31st. So everybody comes into town on Sunday night. We kind of gather and then classes start Monday morning through Friday. Um, they try to finish up around <coughs> If we already reserve spots, is that still going to be? Because I had emailed. Yes, reserve oh. spots and the ones that were on the waiting list last year will be uh, pulled into first considerations for this year. How big a plan? I mean, 20? Um, we've done 25 the past uh, year or two that I've been here. We've had 25, 25 students. So if anybody wants to go to that, we need to... Yeah, yeah the, the, the notification will be put up on the law, on the instructor's page, um, the law enforcement page. Um, like I said, I we finally got the notification that they were accepted, and I just have to put it up on the form and put it up on the web. Well, people have been <laughs> emailing in and holding a spot, and we did have a waiting list from last year, which is kind of, I mean, I see that as a positive because more law, law enforcement agencies are hoping to you know, get their people trained in specific snowmobile enforcement and operations. So that's pretty much it. I thank you all for your time and everything that you do. I believe I'm turning it over to uh, you have her. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, no, he's with me. Okay. <laughs> but he can run that for you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, really 
delay traffic tickets and things from there because it does affect vehicle and traffic law. So it's, uh, Parks and Recs really isn't covered under it, but it's going to be the net effect of everything that happens. So we're just going to go over the process in a very, very quick PowerPoint for which some of you may have already seen um, or a version there of it. So we'll just go over it. Um, okay, so, oops. So effective January 21st, all forms of pre arraignment bail have been abolished and um, there are new restrictions on law enforcement detaining individuals pending arraignment. So we now have what's called non-qualifying offenses um, and um, n the least restrictive non-monetary conditions. Uh, most of you for what we're talking about here will be talking about appearance tickets anyway. Um, so I'm sure you are all well aware of this process. So we're really talking about appearance tickets, which you will be writing on your ticket. Um, they are required on all misdemeanors and Class E felonies, which I'm sure you already know about. But the most important part is they are returnable with an outside day limit of 20 days, which once again, I'm sort of repeating myself, but just to remember this. Now, a lot of our courts previously only had one day a month for some of our courts may have only had one day a month for appearances. They know they are all adding a second day minimum to make the 20 day outside limit appearances. So you have to look at what day is your next court date. We are going, I'm going to at least for Lewis County try to put together when the courts are all meeting for their 20 day outside limit. When their schedule is, um, we have uh, noticed that that is actually gonna require some courts to meet three times because depending upon how many like Thursdays fall in the if you aren't careful, <coughs> they're gonna meet outside the 20 day limit. So we're gonna have to check this and get a schedule out to all law enforcement agencies for the month so that when you're writing appearance tickets, you are writing them within the 20 days. So you're gonna to have to look at it because some might be within a very short period of time. Some might be right at that 20 day limit. As you know, that's going to trigger discovery because discovery is within 15 days now of that arraignment date on that ticket. Is everybody kind of following me with this? Your appearance ticket is also UT50 is what you're saying too? Yep. Okay, right. yep. I'm following. <clears throat> Which means for this process, your supporting depositions need to be handed to the individual at the time you handle that ticket for the appearance ticket because discovery is attached to it, which I'm sure is probably what you've been hearing at Coliseum <coughs> for this information. Whereas before you just handed the ticket, they got to check the box for that supporting deposition and you got to do it later on, that's not the process anymore. You're gonna handle that supporting deposition at the same time because that's at least covering that part of it at this time and then we're gonna figure out what we're doing about everything else. But for right now, has everybody kind of got that part? Okay. Um, there are exceptions, as you now know, to the um, appearance tickets, but my guess is for what we're talking about here, that's not gonna follow. So without going through all the other training for everything else, we're not talking about, I highly doubt, on the snowmobile tra trails, at least hopefully not. You're not gonna have a DV incident. You're not gonna have a sex offense incident um, or any of those things. If you do, um, hopefully you've been through the training. If you haven't, you want me to go over them, yell now or forever hold your peace. We're good, okay. Um, as you know, which this may be, as Sheriff Carpinelli was talking about, <coughs> really the, the issues of snowmobiling while intoxicated or things of that nature, you are not gonna get a cash bail hold on any of those tickets. I'm sure you know that. One, they're not entitled to it. Two, you're not gonna get it. So that's gonna be an appearance ticket. And you're not gonna get it. They're not entitled to it. They're not, it's not under it. So um, as you've all been through the training, um, as you know, it's ROR unless you have a determination of an individual determination of flight risk. So I, if you want me to expand on this, raise your hand. Otherwise, I think you've all been through a lot of training on this and it's not really applicable to what we're talking about because you are talking about appearance tickets. <coughs> yes? One question, man. 
the Amy Carthy said with, 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 with a DWI or SWI, uh, it was new a fair state because that could still be on the driveway, basically. Working on the French sled. Yeah, it, SWIs and DWIs are not, in, neither are vehicular homicides. Right, so where do we stand as far as law enforcement, as far as impounding the vehicle? They can't really drive it. I mean, we already pulled them over for, you know, for allegedly not being able to operate that vehicle in a safe manner. Where do we stand as law enforcement to impound those vehicles? Well, you have a right to, that individual is not going to be able to, uh, for a DWI in particular, not an SWI, because they're licensed to drive a motor vehicle is not subject to restrictions under the SWI. So you don't necessarily have a right to take them in for an arraignment on an SWI because you're not revoking their driving privileges. Whereas you can arraign them on a DWI because their license <coughs> suspension privileges are being considered, as you know. That's an exception to the appearance ticket. So on a DWI, they can't drive that car back. So unless you find somebody else to drive that car home, you can impound that car. If you have another licensed driver, just like everything else, you can release that. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is uh, higher level security. I'm not going to go through this. You've been through it before, and it really doesn't deal with what we're talking about here. So. Um, this is all our bail review. This really isn't talking about this. What Really what our problem is going to be is the ability for these people to return and answer their tickets on the appearance tickets that they're getting. Um, but as you know, the bail deals just with the qualifying offenses. If a defendant voluntarily requests, or certain conduct during liberty, which are our 53062B scenarios. Um, the qualified offenses, as you know, which is why we're not talking about it in these circumstances, are basically our violent felonies, except our burgs and our homes, and our rob two when we aid another. Um, we are covered <coughs> under all our 130 felony and misdemeanor offenses, our non-drug class A felonies, um, terrorism, all these that are listed. They are not talking about what we're talking about here today, so you are going to be in your appearance ticket scenarios. Um, this really is not applicable for you, so what we are talking about here is just making sure you understand when you give that appearance ticket, you're within 20 days and you're making sure that you are giving that supporting deposition out at the time. What it's going to mean is, depending upon what county you're in, um, is what's gonna happen to those actions because, as I'll get to it with discovery, um, it is applicable. So as you know, discovery is all items and information that relate to the subject matter of the case and are in the possession, custody, or control of the prosecution and persons under the prosecution's control, which is all of you. It's in the charge and possession of any New York State police or any law enforcement agency shall be deemed to be in the possession of the prosecution. So everything you have, I have. And all law enforcement officers shall make available to the prosecution a complete copy of their complete records and files relating to the investigation of the case or the prosecution of the defendant upon a prosecutor's request. So once again, everything you have, we have to have. And once again, these are our 21 categories, which in particular, what relates to you is probably on the next screen, which is all VT and L offenses and everything that goes along with it. So for any, if you're checking radar on the snowmobiles, if you're doing any of that, all of that comes with it. If you write them anything under the VTL, you are going to be subject to this. It does not make subject to the local laws. So any of that, we're okay on. But it does any of the VTL, and you write a lot under VTL. You're reckless driving, what is it? A misdemeanor. The reckless operation. All of these are misdemeanors, so they're going to catch it. You're going to catch it under the VTL. What does that mean? That means is no more than 15 days after arraignment and any form of accusatory instrument, including a felony complaint. That also means your misdemeanor complaints. So that means when you get that 20 days accusatory instrument and you give them that appearance ticket, what has happened? Once again, Ed Mantra, 
is that 15-day discovery starts, which means you have to get your entire packet to a district attorney's office, not within that 15 days, because that 15 days is our time to get to the defense attorney or the defendant from arraignment. So if you're 20 days out from the date of arraignment, let's say you were able to get 15 days to that arraignment date, we then have 15 days after that to get to them. So maybe we bought 30 days. That entire packet. So you know what you have done on that case. Has someone else shown up with you? We need their law enforcement contact. Going back. You need all of the 21 categories of discovery on whatever traffic ticket or whatever tickets you've written them for this. If it's an SWI, all your breath documents. If it's under the influence of drugs, you need your DRE and I need all of their curriculum vitae and all of their testing within that time period. And that includes the proficiency test with a 10 year look back. If it was an accident and you did testing, you did accident reconstruction, you had accident reconstruction out there, I need everything on them. I need all of their test results. If you did car to car transmissions, if you did 911 calls, I need all of that. Every state of the license, I need that. Because I've still got to run their criminal histories. I need address contact information from every witness. Remember all of these fun times you've gone and listened to this discovery? That's on every ticket you're writing. Which is why this is, as you've heard us at nauseum, an incredible piece of legislation. And I don't know that the word incredible is meant to be wonderful. Are there any questions? You know this. You, you've heard it at nauseum from all of us. This also applies to the tickets that you're writing on the snowmobile trails, particularly when you're writing it under the BTL section. Okay, is there any questions on this? Because this applies, this is the same. Any questions? Yes. I'm just blown away by all the information that these guys have to Ladies have to give I'm a What's your name, sir? I don't Dave know. Figure from the Post Standard and NYF.com. Okay. Any estimate on how much longer it's going to take to actually write a ticket? It will take longer who's to drunk? write the ticket. It's, I mean, I, it's what goes behind it, which is what you've been hearing from the Post Standard if you've attended any of the um, press conferences or any of the things. This is what we've been saying. This is. Very extensive, prohibitive, in some cases, situations that we're dealing with. This did, is I, did I hear you period. correctly that if, if I'm an officer and I pull someone over for snowmobiling while intoxicated, that there's an incentive not to write the person up for SWI because they can get back on their snowmobile and drive away? And then I should write them up for DWI? You can't write them up for DWI. Well, is, is, did I hear you correctly in saying that? Someone can be written up for SWI and hop on their snowmobile and drive away? They yes. Want yeah, yes. This is got, let me tell you something. I'll tell you half the problem is no, no, no this is correct or, or offense to you, but it's the media for not covering things in the downstate area when they pass ridiculous legislation from New York City that affects Albany and us all the way forward. And that, that's, that's where a lot of this is from. It wasn't brought to light to the public, it wasn't brought to light to law enforcement right away. The governor buried it deep in the budget. Um, along with some downstate legislators to hamstring law enforcement. This has nothing to do for the safety of the people. Nothing at all. But the law got passed. <coughs> Wasn't put out there enough. Well, like I'm saying, am I accurate in saying that I could I could be bullet point two or point two five? Yeah. And I'd be pulled over and I'm holding the ticket and the yep. officer says have See a nice later, day. and I just drive away? You got you're it. You're not gonna drive away in a car because you're not gonna Well no, on my snowmobile. Yeah, unless we impound your sled, or I'm not, I'm you know what they say too? The Pardon? I'm not gonna let you leave on the snowmobile. Yes, the officers aren't gonna let you get on the snowmobile. The problem is you're not gonna be you're not gonna be held on bail. So the next day, is it likely that you could find another snowmobile or you could find another car? If you look at some 
recent events across New York State, you will find that individuals have done just that. They have gotten a DWI, they have been released pursuant to this, and they have gone out and there have been fatal within, I believe, a week. If you look across the state, this is what is going to happen. It's not being reported, but that's the problem. It is. This is the law. As of January 1st, 2020, DWIs, vehicular homicides, these types of crimes are not qualifying offenses under this new law, which means these individuals are not entitled to bail, which means they will be given appearance tickets. That's what the law says. So Dave, respectfully, it's not just a snowmobile SWI, they're talking about DWI as well. Don't put that in the article that's only about snowmobiles you can drive away. They're not going to allow you to drive away as law enforcement officers to protect the safety of everybody else. But right. after they go through this process, they can't go to bail. They're going to get let back out. They can go do it again in a car, motorcycle, another a, a boat, a or a snowmobile. Or it or someone just else's car. The snow. Well, well, I mean, you say, hey, that happens Friday night. I'm out riding again Saturday. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Because you're riding Friday night again. Yes. Friday night again. They can ride Friday night again on another one. They can ride another one. Yes. These are not qualified offenses. And yes. this is why I sent this to you. You said the discovery relates to V and T? Yes. VTL yes. tickets? Yes. Most of what we write on snowmobiles are not VTL. The Parks and Recreation ticket. Yes, as far as I can tell, the Parks and Recs doesn't qualify. Okay. Which is what you're going to get, in all honesty, is a net result of while we're trying to deal with all the other charges that do qualify under this, this is going to get scooped up in the volume of what we can do. That doesn't mean we're still going to handle them in the normal fashion in what we do, but you're going to have this process is overwhelming all offices all right. across the state. So that doesn't mean, I think what you should do with Parks is still be sending out your discovery, or okay. not your discovery, excuse me, your supporting yeah. depth when you yeah. do that, yeah. because then that takes care of it for us, okay. but then we will still handle them in the normal process, because all office, a lot of offices are, we're getting some emails in terms of what we're gonna be doing in terms of how people are handling um, traffic tickets. A lot of offices are going to diversion programs, some offices are handling it the same way, but the volume offices have between 10,000 and 100,000 tickets of VTL, depending upon the size of their county and what happens. So everybody's handling it. We're, everybody's kind of feeling that. Like I said, right now, this is what is anticipated is going to happen. So the parks and reps, people are going to, um, we can handle it the same, but because the VTL is going to be probably handled a little different, I think it's going to depend on what people do with this in terms of where it falls in that volume of when we're out trying to figure out what we're doing on burglaries and homicides and sex offenses, where these are going to fall. But you still do your job, we'll still do ours, and see what happens in that interval. Thank you. So that kind of makes sense? Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yep. Does, in Lewis County, Will your office prosecute local law tickets? Such as? If uh, the town of Redfin or the town of Lowville or something has a local law that's, that uh, acts the same as uh, one of the state provisions, will, will you, do you prosecute those? They don't in our county, that's why I'm asking. We, usually the local attorneys. Right. Whatever town attorney it is for that jurisdiction prosecutes their local law. And that, that's the way it works yeah. with us. Yeah. Do you think, and I've been kind of tossing this around in my head. Is changing some of the things to local law? Well, no, not changing the local law, but what, what I'm thinking about, we've steered clear of the local law, even though we have them on the books, because it was kind of old school. There's been some discussion about writing I'm thinking about I'm thinking about changing back to the local law, yep. because my district attorney has basically said, and I'm sure you're in the same boat, we, we're barely going to have time for traffic tickets. I mean, yep. Perkmore County encompasses the New York State Thruway. Yep. He's got thousands, and he's basically said it's going to be like the Wild West after January 1. So snowmobile tickets are really going to take a backseat. Yep. I'm trying to think what's best for my community, and right now I'm thinking local law is the way to go because I do have a very good and aggressive town attorney that's willing to help me, where I'm not going to get that help from the district attorney. I office. think it's a good suggestion. Part of the problem is, it's, it's going to be this, what's going to happen? I think there's going to be 
a wait time because it's going to take some time for people to figure this out. As soon as that happens, it's going to be like this because that discovery process is going to be impossible to be handled in, in all honesty for some traffic tickets. But once that's figured out, then the, that process is going to be like, I'm just going to do, oh, hey, you know, let's take advantage of that system. Um, I can't tell you what to do. I would say use your resources. This is going to be a, a thought of what is the best way to still do our job under the resources that we have and procure safety <coughs> for our communities with the resources we have until and hopefully things might change. I just know our VA's office is overwhelmed. Yeah, absolutely. Also, yeah. Whether you have 600 people in your office, then you have the multitude of that situation, or whether you have two. It's going to be the same situation. I think the use of some local laws and some other things will be potentially the way to still do that and to be able to evolve that situation. But this is going to be, we're all saying this is going to have to find new ways to do business a little bit because this is an overwhelming concept for us. Because you have 15 days, you don't have 15 days to get it to us because you can't get it to us on day 15. because. We have to get it to them on day 15. So to <laughs> procure this information in the timely fashion in which it has to be done, on the volume of cases that we're handling, we all know what that means for all of us. And I think we have been at this for a long time in comparison to when the law was passed. I think some individuals are just now sort of seeing, holy crap, what does this mean? And. Um, I think that's going to be a huge learning curve from January 1st because sadly we recognize that there may very well be some tragedies. And we have been referred to as foundering by um, individuals from downstate by, by making these comments. Yes. Um, I sit on a village board in Madison County and my police chief has been jumping up and down about this for a while. You know, I haven't sat through any of these classes, but is, is this whole premise started because to alleviate the pressure for arraignments in the courts, or, or what, what prompted this whole thing? I'm appalled at some of the things that are on I'll, I'll tell you what prompted it. didn't come from the courts. It came from Rikers Island Prison in New York City. It came from some downstate uh, politicians out of Queens, Brooklyn, that uh, weren't happy with the way the minorities were being treated. They thought they were being held up too long in the jail there. Um, New York State commissions couldn't handle or couldn't, uh, how to say, um, straighten out the problems of Rikers Island, and some uh, justice, so-called justice groups got involved. Uh, they got some of their local Democratic politicians to uh, push a, a really ridiculous, injurious, um, inflammatory, death-waiting bill to come through. And then the governor signed it on top of that. That's how it's all about. Like, could you, could you listening to this, you could, you could go out, DWI, call and burglarize your house, yeah, and get released, and then per discovery, for my defense, I can come back with my lawyer and have to walk through your house to help my defense. Not just a burglary, a rape. We'll bring the so suspect back into your house to walk through your house after you've been raped. You yes, can manslaughter as well. It's, you know, DWI that you are, and that's yeah. it. Yes. No, there you have it. That's what you see. That's, that's, that's the media and that's your downstate politicians that did that to you. Okay? I got another story right now. <laughs> <laughs> you think this is going to stop people from writing tickets more? No, I want, what we have tried to do, what I think every prosecutor and every law enforcement officer has tried to do and has said is we recognize what is required of us to do. Everyone is going to do everything they can to continue business as is. We recognize that there are a lot of things that are being asked of us in very short periods of time. We are going to, there will probably have to be some priorities that come through. Um, and we will, if we have to, we'll explain to the public what is happening and why it's happening. But there, there's not a single person in this audience who did take an oath of office to protect the community for a reason. They stood there, they took an oath, oath, oath of office to protect their community, and they're going to continue to do that no matter what is really thrown at them. We'll do it under the law, under the circumstances that we're given every single day, 
and will continue to do that. Well, well, our politicians do that, Lee. I'm not going to put anybody in the spot, but you know, that's what you have to tell our men and our women who want to go and force. This is why I get so angry about this. Every day you got to pump them up and tell them to go do a good job. We have a governor who took an oath of office, you have senators who took an oath of office, and several of them took an oath of office, and they violated that oath. Now they're going to put it upon our men and women in law enforcement and say they're going to violate their oath? I don't think so. Shame on those politicians downstate to put our men and women in this position. Maybe 
and I don't know, and I'm not going to speak to that without knowing the facts, but it was probably written as an accident whereupon then a natural medical cause occurred. So it could be a technical situation as to how it was written, but I think you'd be very hard to get the fact that that may have had a medical causation following an accident. No different than you would have had difficult had that been a car accident followed with a medical emergency behind the wheel of a car. It's sort of the same thing. I mean, you got to put it in that situation. There are some incidences where you don't get medical examiner's reports on anything else. I mean, those are highly protected reports. I mean, have you ever, tell me you've ever, I can't believe you've ever gotten a toxicology report. Okay, so you're not going to get it. I mean, you know that. I mean, I, I realize you are in the job of reporting information and factual, but there is also information that cannot be released in that form to you. And it's not meant to hide things, but it'd be no different than if a guy was driving a car, smashed into a tree because he had a medical event on the way. Yeah. On the answer report, it's listed as alcohol involvement in the officer. Um, so that could be used for the officer to indicate alcohol involvement. Others, without going into the furniture for us, correct? So the answer report lists the alcohol involvement. That, yeah, that's up there. I mean, that's, there's information worked out between the investigating officer and no different than on regular accidents. Yes. Well, I think some people are reluctant to report alcohol involvement in the, in the, in the toxicology reports come back and it didn't show that. Well, and then the action report said it did, then it turns into a whole, yeah. I think some officers just kind of <coughs> not report alcohol involvement yeah. on the scale because, yeah, maybe you do know and keep down your heart, but you really don't know. Well, I would say that if something comes back and you see that there was no alcohol in the system, then you need to amend your report. Because you are not basing that on any information that's factually accurate. Anything? Other than anger at everybody passing this law that I didn't do? <laughs> All right. I need my tech guys because I don't know how to do it. Thank you. Thank you.